Ben Gertzel here. Welcome to this next iteration in the general theory of general intelligence uh, video series. What I talk, want to talk about now is ways to quantify and and measure general intelligence. And this, uh, you know, this is something that there's some controversy about how important it really is for the task of building general intelligences. I mean, some people think that once you've defined formally what AGI is, you most of the way there to building it because the main obstacle in the way of creating AGI is just conceptual confusion about the nature of the end goal. Other people think formal definition of what intelligence is is almost irrelevant. I mean, just like formal definition of what life is is probably irrelevant to you know, creating microorganisms, creating artificial life in the in the in the in the biology lab. I'd say I I started out a little more on the former side and then have drifted toward toward the latter side. You know, when I when I wrote my first book, The Structure of Intelligence, which was written largely in the late 80s and published in 1991, I mean I I gave a definition of general intelligence there and gave a sort of semi-mathematical formalization of it. I, I said, intelligence is the ability to solve complex goals in complex environments. And, you know, to me, at the time, that was helpful in clarifying my thinking about general intelligence. At this point, I would no longer consider that really a, even a thorough model of what general intelligence is. But it captures a significant slice of it. And, you know, capturing that slice of general intelligence did help me to sort of formulate what kinds of algorithms, what kinds of systems could be generally intelligent according to that definition. And I mean, that led me down the path of figuring out, okay, there can be some very simple algorithms that could be very generally intelligent according to that definition of achieving complex goals in complex environments, but these very simple algorithms, you know, are not computationally feasible given the amount of resources that we have in, in the real world. So then you have to get much more complex to achieve this mandate of, of being able to achieve complex goals in complex environments in the real world, given the, the constraints that we have. So yeah, for me, defining general intelligence in a certain way, even a limited way, was part of the quest toward figuring out how to build general intelligences. On the other hand, the more I understood about general intelligence, the more I could see that no one measure or quantification really captures it. In fact, much of the essence of general intelligence is the ability to invent, reinvent yourself and reinvent your world and come up with new, new, metrics and new non-metric ways of, of, of evaluating yourself, right? There, there's, not, there's not any one metric that's going to capture the essence of being a generally intelligent mind. And, and uh, that said, I'm going to now plunge into some discussion of formal metrics of, of general intelligence. I mean, a number of years after I published the structure of, of intelligence, I mean, others who were inspired by some of the same previous works as, as, as I had been went in the same direction, but in a much more rigorous and, and well fleshed out way. So uh, Marcus Hooter and Shane Legg gave a formal definition of general intelligence, quite similar in spirit to my achieving complex goals and complex environments, but worked out much more thoroughly from a math sense. And then Marcus Hooder, he articulated an algorithm called AIXI that I'll describe in the next video in this series that he then proved is in some senses optimally generally intelligent according to his, his definition, which was quite similar to arguments I gave in structure of intelligence. But again, he took the time to work out the math quite vigorously, which is, 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 is really cool. It's amazing. And, Actually, Shane Legg's journey on this bore some resemblance to mine, though a few uh, number of years afterwards. He's a lot younger than I am. When I when I first met Shane, you know, he was working for me 
at WebMind Incorporated between, say, 1999 and 2001. He started in WebMind's New Zealand office, and he moved to the New York office, where I got to hang out with him more. And he was convinced at that time, if you could just find the right rigorous definition of general intelligence, then it wouldn't be that hard to figure out how to actually build a real general intelligence. He was frustrated with the vagueness of the word intelligence, so he was going to introduce a new word at that time, cybernance, and give a formal definition of, of cybernance, right? And, you know, after that company that I had co-founded, which was working toward AGI, as well as building some narrow AI products, and within which Shane was my employee, after that company, WebMind Inc., closed the doors in the dot-com crash of, of 2001, Shane went to do his PhD with uh, Marcus Hooter, who was a pioneer of AGI, AGI theory, originally with a, with a physics background, I think. Shane's thesis included, among other things, a formal definition of general intelligence made using algorithmic information theory, similar in spirit to what I'd said in the structure of intelligence well before, but, but building on a bunch of Marcus's math to do things in a much more rigorous way. Nice thesis, Shane proved some nice theorems. After he got his PG, he moved to London. He was doing some computational finance for a bit. Then he started getting into neuroscience. And suddenly when I talked to him, he's like, emulating the brain is the way to get general intelligence. All that abstract math theory helped me clarify my thinking a bit, but in the end, it's probably not going to tell us how to build a thinking machine. And, uh, you know, he paired up with Demis Sasabis, who was interested in, in emulating the brain. I mean, that was a very interesting period. I remember meeting with Demis Sasabis and Itamar Arel at some AI conference in the UK. Itamar was a close friend of mine. He was thoroughly into deep reinforcement learning as a path to AGI. He later founded a company, Apprente, that was sold to McDonald's and became the McDonald's AI lab. And, and I mean, their technology played a key role, for example, in the speech processing and, and speech generation and decision-making involved in automating McDonald's drive throughs right? But at that time, Itamar was still an, an academic, and I remember Itamar and I talking with Demis Asabas. Demis was talking all about deep learning in the hippocampus and the cortex. Itamar and I were banging him over the head that you need to make reinforcement learning work together with, with, with deep learning. And Itamar really felt that deep reinforcement learning was close to the key to AGI. I, I felt that was just part of it and you want logical reasoning, evolutionary learning, and other, other pieces plugged in there. I mean, I, I can't be sure, but I, I felt at the time that Edamar and I, probably mostly Edamar, played a significant role in nudging Demis to think harder about how reinforcement learning could synergize with, with deep learning, which obviously played a big role in what DeepMind did later after he and Shane founded that that company quite recently marcus hooter then went to went to work for uh, his former student shane at at, at deep mind and i'm sure they're doing lots of amazing stuff marcus had some students who were you know intentionally trying to use the general theory of, of general intelligence as laid out by Marcus to drive practical algorithms. Maybe they're doing some of that within DeepMind right now, although Shane seemed to have drifted away from that at the time DeepMind was, was founded. So anyway, all, all these concepts about what is general intelligence, how can you formalize that? These have been part of the mix of thinking about AGI algorithms and concepts and, and, and designs for for a long a long time H however instrumental that th they are I'm not sure but at, at least they're they're inspirational so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, some of the efforts to formalize what is general in intelligence talk about their strengths and weaknesses and then what we'll see in 
subsequent videos in this series, you know, how you can kind of simplify and, and specialize these sorts of abstract definitions to get toward, toward practically realizable AGI systems. So quantifying general intelligence. You could quantify general intelligence in a lot of ways. So before plunging into sort of AIQ test, let's just think about the broad scope of ways you could quantify general intelligence. I mean, you could quantify a lot of things about a complex self-organizing intelligence system. You could quantify how much joy is it feeling, which psychologically is related to the surprising fulfillment of expectations. Like the, you have patterns persisting over time related to the systems, you have new patterns being created, you have emergent pattern between the persistent and the new patterns. And this relates to the amount of joy the system feels. You have growth as a quantity, just how much new pattern is there in that mind, how much mind expansion. You have choice, which you could view as sort of the agency, the, the choice involved in a certain decision is the correlation between the choice involved in that decision and the, the causality in, in, in involved in that decision within the system. So this, this, this becomes a sort of hyperset definition, similar to the hyperset definitions of self and reflective consciousness I gave in, in a previous lecture. And along with other cool things you can, you can measure uh, uh, in the generally intelligent system, you can measure various kinds of problem solving ability or optimization ability. So Leg and Hutter's definition of general intelligence from Chen Leg's PhD thesis, it's, it's a lot like my long earlier definition of general intelligence as the ability to achieve complex goals in complex environments, but they, they formalize it in terms of Salamanoff's universal distribution over computable reward functions. So for a given computable environment with a computable reward function on it, you can say, you know, the intelligence of the system with regard to that environment and reward function is just how much reward can it get? How well does it get rewarded by looking at the environment, taking an action, getting a reward or not, looking at the environment again, taking an action, getting a reward or not, and so forth, by trying to maximize reward through actions in that environment relative to that reward function, how much reward does it get? So then, then you can look at that averaged over all computable environments and all computable reward functions. You can look at on average, how good is this system at getting rewards in, 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 in this environment? And then you ask, how do you weight the average? And this is where Marcus and Shane's cleverness come in. They say, well, let's use an inverse complexity weight, which is a Salamanoff universal distribution, like the more the more complex the environment and reward function is, the less you weight it. So that the, the ability to solve simpler reward functions in simpler environments is weighted higher. So then you have universal intelligence. Universal intelligence of an agent is his expected performance with respect to the universal distribution. Very beautiful and elegant, right? And, you know, I made this a little uglier and less elegant in a follow-up paper I, I, I published where I said, well, okay, the universal distribution is elegant, but is it really what matters, right? Like you could actually take any weighting function over goals and environments. Say you could weight the goals that matter to humans more. You could weight the environments that are relevant to humans more. And you can compute the average goal achievement ability of an agent over goals and environments that are weighted according to relevance to human existence or something, right? And that, that's very similar to Leg and Hutter's definition, but it has a different weighting function. So that this is more like, instead of just saying intelligence is the ability to achieve complex goals in complex environments, you're saying intelligence is the ability to achieve relevant complex goals in relevant complex environments where you're defining what is relevant. And you can then also take computational resources into account, what I call the efficient pragmatic general intelligence. It says basically intelligence is the ability to achieve relevant complex goals in relevant complex environments using a reasonable amount of computational resources. Because 
if you're using a non-reasonable amount of computational resources, you can't do it in the real world, right? And so that's uh, that can be defined formally as well. And there's also allied concepts. Like you can say of all the goals and environments that a system does well at, how diverse are they? Are they all just variations on the same theme? Or is there a lot of breadth to the goals and environments that this system is, is good at fulfilling? And this is sort of how general, how broad is, is, is the intelligence of, 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 of the general intelligence, right? So, I mean, all these are interesting ways to assess an intelligent system. I don't think it will be wise to build an intelligent system focused on any one of these particular goals. Actually, you know, the human mind is not focused on any one particular goal. I mean, you could take an evolutionary psychology view and say we're focused on on reproduction. I mean, I I, I sort of seem to be. I've had five kids so far. On the other hand, I could have had 15 kids, right? Some people don't have have any kids. Some people are are gay. I mean, there, there there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, wiggle room in, in in trying to interpret propagation of our, of our DNA and species as as our our top level goal. And clearly, you know, optimizing computable reward functions in computable environments is not what most humans are 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 all about, right? I mean, a lot of what we're doing is not about achieving any any goal at all really we're not in, we're not entirely goal directed systems and i think the fact that we're not entirely goal directed and that insofar as we are goal directed we have a bunch of different goals which may shift over our lifetime we may want to reproduce and spread our dna we're in some ways selfish we're in, in some ways altruistic we're in some ways pursuing abstract you know, scientific or aesthetic or cultural goals. I think this this wild mix of different goals and this mix of goal pursuit and non-goal pursuit that characterizes humanity is a, a feature rather than a bug. I mean, I mean, I think that's part of the richness of what makes us such amazing, generally intelligent systems. And this brings us to what my friend Weaver, AKA David Weinbaum, called in his PhD thesis, open-ended intelligence. So Weaver's view of intelligence is quite different than saying intelligence is about achieving complex goals and complex in, in environments or any of the, the sort of derivations of that, like Leg and Hutter's universal intelligence definition. I mean, Weaver's view of intelligence is an intelligent system is a self-organizing, self-creating system that's reinventing and rebuilding itself all the time you know, recognizing patterns in itself and its environment, creating new patterns in itself and its environment, growing and exploring, and its open-endedness extends to there being no specific metric that, it, that it's always going to be good at optimizing. It's always growing and redefining everything. And I think this, uh, this way of thinking about intelligence has a lot to recommend it. On the other hand, you know, these more limited ways of defining general intelligence, complex goals and complex environments and all that. I think these give you a bunch of interesting guidance about how to architect AGI systems. So I think that they are, they are worthwhile. They're not complete in terms of the guidance they give you about building AGI systems. And you can't forget the open-ended freewheeling sort of self-organizing part either, but the parts of general intelligence that these sort of optimization and goal achievement definitions address, those parts of general intelligence are important ones to get right in, in building a general intelligence, which we'll talk about in some of the subsequent videos in this, in this series.